tonight. Father, we bless you. We praise you. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name.
you be exalted. May you be glorified. Right now, Lord God, we set our affection. We give our attention. Father, we give you, Lord God, our hearts, Father, tonight, our ears and our minds, Father God, that we might be renewed, Lord God, by your word, that we might be conditioned, oh God, Father, by our fellowship with one another. We thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord God, for who you are. I wonder if anyone in the house tonight can just clap your hands and give God praise. Come on and give God praise. Why don't you turn to someone and greet them tonight? And Miss Kaylee, if you go ahead with the announcements. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Amen. Cliffdale, a safe place to land. Praise God for those announcements tonight. Just have a couple of announcements that we want to reiterate. Of course, this Saturday at 10 o'clock, we will be having our unique woman breakfast over in the law building, ladies. Let's represent, okay? <laughs> All right. And then also next week, potluck. It'll be potluck night next Wednesday for um, our, so everybody bring a dish. Um, the youth, if you're still in here, you are dismissed to go over to the log building. And also remember that our youth are collecting recipes for the Cliffdale cookbook. So um, the papers are out there in the foyer for you to get it. And uh, if you're like me, I'm going to go to my favorite recipe, not one exactly that I make, uh, Greg, but <laughs> I'll be looking it up. But anyway, any of those, they do want to put together a cookbook. So with all that being said, let's prepare our tithes and offerings. <laughs> Amen. And my word of encouragement for, yes, we want to welcome out our first-time visitors as we are preparing. If it's your first time, please raise your hands. Our ushers would love to get give you some information. Amen. <laughs> as we're preparing our offering tonight, I just want to encourage us that um, indeed the worship continues when the offering time comes. As a matter of fact, some places they flow right from singing the songs into giving. And I just want to encourage you in that, you know. So I want to just give you a moment that you might participate um, in with our worship. We're going to go ahead and call our ushers forward and pray. So if you have your offering, if you lift it up, Father, we thank you. We praise you. Father, for it is you that gives seed to the sower, and I just declare that we're all sowers in here, Father. 
we realize that the place that we sit, Lord, is fertile, good ground, doing many great things and helping people all over the world, Father. So, Lord, by faith tonight, what we give, Lord God, and we thank you in advance for all the work that it will do, even the smallest of seeds tonight, Father, how it will do things in with more pl- multiplicity, Father. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget, if you're watching on the web, that you can give by um, going to our website, cliffdellalive.com. You can give via uh, text, 910-499-4749. You can also mail your, ch- your checks and your uh, offerings, or you can drop it off at the office. Amen. Amen. Hello? There I am. Okay. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody doing good tonight? So how do you feel about this season so far that we've entered into this 2024? Hallelujah. (laughs) Amen. Hallelujah. I won't get into the Hebrew of that, but. There is no such thing as a true, quiet hallelujah. Yeah, halal means an exuberant praise. And that's what hallelujah is, halal to Yahweh. So amen, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I do know this this thing about there being a a great and open door, but there are many adversaries. I don't know about you, but anyone experienced a little bit of that going into 2024? Well, I want to encourage you that the promises of God have not changed. Amen. 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 The promises of God have not changed. The enemy would love to manipulate our emotions so that we don't see what what God wants to do in this season. Anyone beside me experience that? Amen. (laughs) But I want to know, want you to let you know tonight, you got to keep your focus on Jesus. Amen. You got to keep your focus on Jesus. This is not a time or a season to be flipping, to be dipping, to be tripping, or any of those other ipping words. Amen? This is a time to know where you stand in Christ and to stand there. Amen? It's also a time to seize new ground. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Zechariah chapter 1. We're going to take a brief break from the book of Romans, to be totally honest with you, I don't even know that I could jump in where Pastor Josh left off and do it justice. <laughs> so we're going to let, we're gonna let the, the, the senior pastor come in and take care of business next week. Amen. But um, tonight we're going to be looking at chapter one of the book of Zechariah. We're specifically looking at the first vision in a series of nine visions that are contained within Zechariah's first six chapters. These visions are concerned with the subject of restoration because God wants to do a work of restoration this year. That is one thing I've heard, uh, especially toward the tail end of last year, and the Lord didn't give me liberty to share it at the watch night service, but God wants to do a work of restoration this year. He wants to restore some things. And I, I think there was a prophecy came last night at the prayer that, that the glory of this latter house will be greater than that of the former. And somebody ought to be shouting right now. Because this glory of this former house, amen, Cliffdale Church, was not small. Jesus. Was not small. So if God's promise is that the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than that of the former, amen, get excited. Because God's, hey, the enemy may be moving, but God is on the move. And that's, that is worth shouting about. Amen. Amen. But these visions outline, they outline principles that God wants us to move us through as he's trying to restore some portion of our life. And to tell you the truth, we're all in a work of restoration. Amen. Because all of us are descended from Adam and Eve, and we know what happened in the Garden of Eden. Right? They gave up everything. And God sent Jesus to help win it back. to to provide the means to win it back. And now God is working through us to restore us to where we're supposed to be. Amen? So God's doing a work of restoration. He wants to do some restoration in our lives. Amen? 
And he, he's the God who will restore the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, and, and all the, those other weird worms in Joel 2.25. God is the God who restores. Somebody ought to be claiming that promise, say, I'm taking that this year. Amen? So if you have Zechariah 1, I'm going to read a little bit at length all the way down to verse 17. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they didn't hear, they didn't listen to me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, Just as the Lord of hosts determined to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our deeds, so has he dealt with us. Verse 7, On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow. And behind it were the horses, red, sorrel, and white. Then I said, Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said unto me, I will show you what these are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are the ones who the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which you were angry these seventy years? And the Lord answered the angel who talked with me with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said, Proclaim, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for, Z for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great zeal. And I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry, and they helped, but with evil intent. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house will be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line will be stretched out over, the, over Jerusalem. And again proclaim, thus saith the Lord of hosts, my cities again shall be spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. May God bless the reading of his word. Father, we thank you, God, for this evening, for your promises and your word. We know that they are yes and amen. And God, I thank you for the privilege of being alive in this season. I thank you for the privilege uh, of being able to serve you in this season, God. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, anoint me, God, so that your words will come forth, God, that you would encourage us in the warfare that we now face, but also encourage us that we are overcomers and you help us to overcome through the blood of your son, Jesus. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know what you think about everything that I just read. Some of you may have read it for the first time. I don't know. I know it's not a, a widely preached from chapter of the Bible, but I'm pretty sure somebody's thinking, what in the world did he just read to me? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, this is a vision. This is a vision. And God sometimes communicates to mankind using visions. Or, to use a modern analogy, using movies. So we get these movies when we're asleep, we call them dreams. We get these movies when we're awake, we call them visions. But what it is, is it's God communicating to us in pictorial form, using movies, using film strips. And when he does this, he often gives us symbols. There are symbols in the vision. And if we can interpret the symbols properly, then we can understand the vision. Somebody might say, well, why does God do all that? Why doesn't he just tell us what he wants to say, right? Well, number one. We remember pictures better, don't we? You heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words? 
Well, that's one of the reasons why God uses visions. Another reason why God uses visions is so we will look for the answer. (laughs) Proverbs says it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. But the honor of kings is to search out a matter. You see, there's something to us searching things out. When we search things out, when we seek God for the answers, for mysteries he gives to us, we spend time with him, in relationship with him. It deepens our relationship. And another thing that it does is it helps us in the process that we're walking through. Because kingdom is all about processes. Amen? We're we're all going through processes. And God is processing us. And that really, even though it isn't always fun, some of our processes aren't always fun, it really should get us excited because God, the Holy Spirit, is doing a work inside of us to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ so that we will look like Him, so that we will become the version of ourselves that God desired when He created us. Amen? God loves us. He passionately loves us. And you know why that gets me excited is because, you know, I came to Jesus because I needed him because I was lost in my sin, right? And, I, you know, he set me free from my sin, but the power to continue in my sin, if it was left up to me, yeah, you forget about it. I'd take all his good gifts and squander them, Right? But the Holy Spirit is working a work through me that will be perfected, you know, in the day that I see him. And that brings me excitement because this doesn't depend on me. Because if it depended upon me, I'd be in trouble. Amen? (laughs) Anybody know what I'm talking about? But this is God working in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's exciting. Amen? And another thing is Jesus, so another clue to why we get visions is Jesus spoke in parables to build hunger in people's hearts so they would seek after him. God wants us to seek after him. He wants us to hunger and thirst for him. And, and, but before, as we look in this vision, before we begin to dig into this vision and unpack this vision, I find it necessary to let you know what was going on in the lives of the people who Zacharias spoke the vision to. You see, if we understand why God is speaking through visions, why God is speaking through these visions to Zechariah the way that he does, we can better understand how to apply these visions into our own life. If we know what the people who he was ministering were going through, we can, we can begin to see the principles that are outlined in this vision And every one of these visions in Zechariah, even though they seem extraordinary and mystical, they really are very much down to earth. And they echo godly principles of restoration that will help us to walk in God's restoration process. So, the story starts with Moses. You know Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and God formed a nation out of the children of Israel. He did this because he wanted them to be an example of the restoration that God wanted to do in the lives of all mankind. He wanted other people to see the the children of Israel and see that they were living kingdom ways and see that God's ways were better and be attracted to God. That's why God called the nation of Israel to himself is because he wanted them to be an example to the world. So Moses led Israel out out of Egypt and Joshua led them into Canaan. And they got in their promised land, right? Everything should have been great once they got in the promised land. But they didn't always serve God. First they were led by judges, later by kings, but they didn't serve God. Sometimes they would have periods of great revival and seek passionately after God. But then they would, when things got, life got good, they would forget about God. And they would go chasing after idols and the desires of their heart. Oh, come on, let's not act like we, we don't do that. Come on. You know? But, but that's what they did, and it was back and forth and back and forth, you know, 
Yes, I'm hungry for God. And, oh, that looks good over there. Ooh, let me chase after this. Oh, look at that, you know. And the next thing you know, they're falling down and worshiping idols and forgetting all about God. And, and, and as time went by, back and forth, but their society became more and more and more and more depraved further and further away from God until God had to intervene and correct the situation. So God did intervene and correct the situation. And if you read about the story about this, God is very clear. God says, I did it. I did this. <laughs> God sent Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, to destroy God's temple. God's house destroyed it. To destroy the city of Jerusalem. And to carry almost all of God's people into captivity. Why would God do this? God did this because his people were misrepresenting him by engaging in all sorts of abominable practices, hurting others in the process, and repeatedly ignoring his many, many calls to repent of their sins and be healed. You see, when believers walk in unrepentant sin or act the way the world does, People in the world are falsely led to believe that God will tolerate their unrepentant sin. God won't tolerate our unrepentant sin. That's why he sent Jesus to take care of it. But when we do this, we misrepresent God's kingdom. This is a tough part. Tuck your toes. We actually stand in the way of other people finding Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing about being a servant of God. You're a witness, whether you like it or not. And you're either witnessing to God's greatness and goodness and glory, or you're witnessing to something else. Because we have the name Jesus on us, we testify of him wherever we go, and we do it with our works first, long before we ever do it with our words. And that's why many, sometimes when we're quick and eager to share, the, share about the good things that God has done in our life, Sometimes people don't want to hear it because they've been watching how we live. We have a responsibility in this. And, and, and I'm not trying to be mean, but, but I'm trying to challenge us to come up higher because we have a responsibility. God has given us the goodness of Christ. We have a responsibility to, 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 to live it out. So God had to correct the course. He wasn't, God loves too much. And he wasn't going to just let his people go on declaring we're the people of God while doing all sorts of abominable things that would pull people, draw people away from truly serving God. So he, he pressed the divine reset button. He hauled them away out of their country, out of their land, all the way to Babylon. He pulled his people into another country to restore them to himself. Anybody ever went through this? This is what's called a wilderness season. When God pulls us away from active ministry, he pulls us away from a season of extreme busyness, so, and he pulls us aside so he can deal with issues in our lives that prevent us from reflecting him. You know, there's something about being out in the backside of the desert listening to the wind, you know, and you're just standing there all by yourself alone that makes you really begin to think, where am I really at with God? You know what I mean? Anybody ever been there? But God did not intend for this period of captivity to destroy his people completely. He wanted this to be a time of restoration, that they would repent of their sins and turn to him. He intended it to be a time of purification, that anti-kingdom beliefs and life patterns would be removed from their lives, and they would be restored to a purified worship of him. He mercifully declared this time of captivity would only last 70 years. He said, 70 years and I'll bring you back. He wanted them to progress through this time, be restored to him, return to their land and rebuild. He wanted to move them through a process of restoration so that they would once again represent him in this world. And God kept his word. 2 Chronicles 36, 22 through 23 tells us, A later king named Cyrus rose up and decreed, put out this grand decree. He said, listen, where are all the people who serve Yahweh? 
I want you to pack up your bags. I want you to go back to the land of your fathers and rebuild the temple. And you know what? I'm encouraging everyone around you to help you, to give you materials, to give you money, to give you gold, whatever it is you need to go back and to rebuild that temple. Wow, what a miracle. Incredible miracle. And you would think all of God's people would have immediately got ready and packed up their bags and, and sold their houses and got ready to go. But most of them didn't. Most of them chose to remain in the land of their captivity. You see, they had become comfortable in a place that was intended to be temporary. They set up a home in a wilderness. What was supposed to be a temporary process became a permanent residence and kept them from God's promises. See, we got to be careful. Sometimes when God pulls us aside, we've got to realize it's only temporary, and He doesn't want to sit us down, so to speak. He doesn't want that to become a permanent thing. He doesn't want us to build a home there, but He wants us to learn from it so that He can get us to the place where He wants us to be. And, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the Holy Spirit, this being His process and all that. Many times we're like the Apostle Paul was kicking against the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit is trying to work his process in our life. But these people chose to stay when it was time to move. Listen, Cliffdale. Hear me spiritually, okay? It's time to move. God's got things he wants to, us to do this year. God's got things he wants you to do this year in this house. And you've got to be ready to do what he wants you to do when he calls you to do it. Right. It's not time to be sitting around. You know, you, this is not your wilderness season. This is not your time to sit in the back row and watch other people move on. God wants, he's got a work for you to do in this season. And some people got that. Some people did return. They obeyed the Lord's command. They returned to the city. They probably entered the city with songs and with gladness. But I'm sure their faces dropped when they saw the city. Because the city had been tore down, was in ruins. And when a ruined city sits dormant for 70 years, it can be quite run down. But that didn't deter them. They began to rebuild. They constructed a new foundation for the temple. They set themselves to rebuild the temple. They began to do the work of the Lord. But they had neighbors who didn't like. These people are getting beat up on every side, aren't they? <laughs> First they're having trouble getting out of their own land. Now they get there and the land's all messed up. But, but they keep building. But now the neighbors are attacking them. And the neighbors didn't like the idea of, had anybody felt like that? Every time I'm trying to step out and do something good for God, there's somebody trying to resist me? Hmm. But those neighbors resisted the building of the temple. They tried everything they could think of to hinder the work of God. And guess what? Their efforts worked. They were able to force God's people to stop rebuilding. God's people stopped working on the temple, stopped building God's house, and began to focus on their own personal needs. Weeks turned to months, months turned to years, and no work went on in the house of God for 15 years 15 long years the house of God sat desolate and the people who had returned to God's house with such high hopes now turned from their destiny and began to embrace a meager existence and life was difficult taxes were high living conditions were bad and they were living in ruins and when they sowed their crops the return was very little they had been beaten down by life and were now in a self-destructive cycle of walking in the absence of God's blessing because they were not honoring God by rebuilding His temple. They had shifted out of walking in faith and honoring God, and now they were in survival mode, doing whatever they could to get by, but they didn't realize that part of their problem was themselves. God was resisting them because they were resisting God. They were not moving in faith and not honoring God by putting the construction of God's house first. So God was not honoring them. They had removed themselves from the blessing of God. Remember, 1 Samuel says, For those that honor me, I will honor, God says. And they that despise me will be lightly esteemed. 
And I want to encourage you in this season, no matter how difficult it seems, we got to put God first. we got to put His needs, His wants first. Sometimes that means sacrifice. Sometimes that means you're going to have to go the extra mile with somebody. Sometimes it means you're going to have to be in this house working on something when nobody else is here. Sometimes it means you're going to have to be doing things that you don't want to do. But God sees your sacrifice, and God will honor your sacrifice because you're honoring Him. But God had mercy on these people who were going through this difficulty, going through this time of difficulty. God had mercy on them, and He sent two prophets to encourage them to change their attitude to rebuild the house of God. These prophets' names were Haggai and Zechariah. You can read about them in Haggai and Zechariah and the book of Ezra. Yeah, not Nehemiah. Nehemiah's a little bit later. Haggai went the direct route. When he showed up, he said, he said listen, guys, your life is difficult because you're not rebuilding God's house. Put God first, and he'll put you first. And when they started rebuilding again, then he even challenged them. He said, mark this day when you started rebuilding, and note it, watch what happens to your crops. And sure enough, God's blessing returned and they began to experience abundant, God, abundant crops. You see, if you will put God first in everything that you do, He will put you first. But Zechariah had more than a temple in mind. He knew God really wanted to restore His people and that the rebuilding of God's temple was only part of the process. Zechariah would eventually go on to tell about the coming of Messiah and the final restoration of Israel yet to come. There are prophecies in his book that have not yet been fulfilled. But he begins by talking about nine visions that are nine steps in God's restoration process. But the very first step before you even get to any of the visions is repent. Repent. Return to God. Listen, if you're going to see God move in your life the way that He's supposed to move, you got to repent. If you're going to see revival, you got to repent. I thought of this recently, and it, it's, it's definitely worth saying in election year because the election of a president is not going to bring revival. Only prayer and repentance can do that. Only prayer and repentance can do. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. That's what brings revival. And Zechariah begins with his call to repentance. He said, listen, God was mad. He was angry with your forefathers. That's why he let them destroy your city and destroy his temple. And he reminds them why. He said, listen, these people were committing all sorts of despicable acts that hurt others. They refused to repent of these sins, even though God sent many, many prophets to warn them. They hardened their hearts. Don't be like them. Repent, consider your ways, change your, heart, your mind and repent. And you know, believers are still called to repent. We walk a life and many times God hits us with, it's time to repent. Amen? But remember, the Holy Spirit is the author of this. We don't have to get wrapped up in, oh no, did I sin? Oh no. No, the Holy Spirit will let you know when you sin. I'm a witness. Amen. I'm a witness. The Holy Spirit will let you know when you sin. And we, should, we as believers should not resist calls to repentance. In our Christian walk, the Holy Spirit will sometimes convict us of sin. When He does, just confess it, repent of it, forsake it. You're forgiven. Now keep going. And don't think about it again. And that's what I mean by repent quickly. Because you know what the devil will do. He'll twist your thinking up until you're all bound up thinking, oh no, does God even love me? You know, no. Repent quickly. And repentance, it, well, I, I just love these scriptures, so I'm just going to say them. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I like 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these write unto you so you will not sin. And if anyone does sin... 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Jesus is up there in heaven fighting for us. So we got to give him something to fight with. Repent. Amen? And God has a process. And, and Miss Kaylee, if you could put that slide up with God's process of re revival and restoration, the Acts 3 slide. But if you turn to your Bible in Acts 3, 19 through 21, the Word of God says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of revival will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will send Jesus Christ, which before was preached to you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So God's, God's uh, process of, of repentance consists of four things, four basic things. Number one, repent. That li literally means to change your mind. Metaneo, right? Be converted to change your actions so they line up with your mind change. Then God will forgive your sins. Your sins will be blotted out. Then when times of revival come from the presence of the Lord, you can experience revival. And then he says, he, Jesus will come later on and times of restoration will come. So you see this, the, the, this process. You repent, then you're converted. You experience, your sins are blotted out. You receive times of, of revival. And then you receive restoration. So really simple, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer, right? And I tell my brother a lie, right? And then I open my Bible and I read that I'm supposed to speak the truth to one another. I said, oh, no. I, I'm not supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to tell lies. I'm a Christian. So what do I do? I repent. I change my mind, right? It's not okay for me to lie. And I'm not going to make excuses for lying, right? Right? So now my mindset is changed. No, lying is not, I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to either speak the truth or not, not say anything at all, right? So then I begin to act according with that belief. I go to my brother, I tell him I'm sorry, right? I, I, every time I'm confronted with situations again in which it's tempting to lie, no, I'm not going to tell a lie because I'm a believer, right? So I repent and be converted. And what does the Bible say? My sins are blotted out. Poof, they're gone. Don't exist anymore. The blood of Jesus is that powerful. That sets me up so that I can experience times of refreshing or times of revival. The word actually literally means a recovery of breath. Anyone ever experienced that where God literally recovers breath? The Bible calls that revival because the word revival literally means to be resurrected from the dead. Now, if, you, if something recovers breath, that means it wasn't breathing. OK, so that means it is it was dead and now is alive. That's revival. That's literally what we mean in the English when we talk about revival. We're talking about something being dead and now alive. Let's say let's say revival happens in your prayer life. Well, what happens? You're not a person who prays. Just don't pray. I don't pray at all. And then I realize I should probably pray. I'm a Christian. OK, so what do you do? You begin a prayer life. I'm praying 15 minutes a, a day. You know what you just experienced? Revival. Your dead prayer life came to life, right? It, it is now alive. You're not, a, a, you know, not praying anymore, but you're praying. That's revival. And there's a supernatural element to this, too, where God brings life. That's where we experience the glory of God, you know, and people react all kind of different ways to the glory of God. Some people run around the church. Some people fall out. Some people roll on the floor. You know, some of you experience some of this stuff, right? But that's people's reactions to the glory of God because they're experiencing revival. Amen? And revi but revival is not the end. Restoration is. God revives us so he can restore something in us. Amen? And that's the process. Now, in this, in this process, we have to remember when God calls us to repentance, he gives us space to repent. Right? He gives us space. He cannot tread upon his grace and mercy. Amen. And that's what God's people did back then. It, 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 see, the, the Zechariah says, listen, your ancestors did not repent, but they didn't live forever. And the prophets who spoke to them, they didn't live forever either. But God's word is eternal. Jesus says it will not pass away. God's standards will outlast 
all people reject them, that who reject them. The ancestors who rejected God's call to repentance later returned and testified that God kept his promises and did what he said. Instead of repenting and turning to God, many people today try to get God to conform his standards to their lifestyle. They might say even... I know God's word says this, but I feel. No, there's one that's even worse. I know God's word says this, but God appeared in vision and told me. Really? Really? Like God's all double minded? No. When, when, When you sin and lightning doesn't strike, that's God's mercy. He's giving us grace to repent. He's giving us time to repent. So what do we need to do? Repent. Amen? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any would perish, but that all will come to prevent it. See? We, 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 we can't tread upon that mercy where he's giving us grace to repent because he loves us. Amen? So we've got to conform our life to the word and not the other way around. Okay, so now shifting into the vision, because the first thing Zechariah did is he, he spoke, the vi- he, he spoke you've got to repent. And then he tells them, listen, I want to, t- I want to tell you this vision, because uh, there's some keys in this vision. And we can get, we, if you could switch to the, the scripture slide again, Miss Kaylee. And then you're going to need to shift to one a- after that really quick, right? And I'm going to read it again to you really quick. And I know there's not a lot of time, but believe it or not, we're going to get through this vision really quick, too. Because God's saying something in this vision that's pertinent and that we need to hear today. And and so he said, I saw by night and behold, there was a man. So it's at night and there's a man riding on a red horse and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow. And behind him were horses, red, sorrel and white. Then I said, my Lord, what are these? So the angel who said, I will show you what these are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are the ones who the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have all walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, the, all the earth is at rest. So really quickly, it's at night. In this vision, it's night. If you could do the next slide, please, Miss Kaylee. It is at night. This indicates a time of spiritual darkness when people are not following God. It reminds us of the time when, remember when Samuel was a boy and first heard the word of God? It talks about he was laying down and before the, 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 um, the lampstand in the, in the, in the um, tabernacle went out. He heard the voice of God calling to him, right? It was a time of spiritual darkness. Okay, so that's what it means by being night. Now the man on the red horse. This confusing vision gets a lot simpler when you begin to realize that the man on the red horse, the angel who talked with Zechariah, and the angel of the Lord are all the same person. One person, he's called three different titles. The reason why he's called three different titles is because he's functioning three different ways in this vision. He's a guide to Zechariah in this vision. He's speaking to Zechariah and helping him understand. He's a head angel that all other angels report to. And he's an angel who appears to God and intercedes on behalf of Israel. So he's the angel of the Lord, he's the man on the red horse, and he's the angel who's talking with Zechariah. Okay? Pretty simple, right? Myrtle trees in a ravine. Trees in a ditch. Okay? Trees represent people. This is consistent with the Bible using trees to represent people in Psalm 1-3, Romans 11-16, Genesis 49-22, Isaiah 53-2, Zechariah 4-12, and Romans uh, Revelation chapter 11. So there's trees and they're people. They represent people. The trees are people. And they're in a ravine. Okay, And the, the myrtle speaks of God's blessing because God... The trees are God's people. They're the people that Zechariah is prophesying to, okay? And they're the people who are supposed to bring blessing to the earth because that's why God created, that's why God called us to be his people, to bring blessing to the earth, amen? So the ravine or the ditch, and the ditch is in a place of darkness. Remember, it's night, okay? The word for this, Hebrew word is metsula, the bottom place of darkness. This indicates the spiritual condition of the people They were in the bottom of society. They were getting beat up by people all around them. 
They, 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 they were not where they were supposed to be. And it also may indicate, spirit, it may indicate depression as well. Okay? And I don't know if, you, if you've ever been in a situation, some people may be going through it where you feel like everything's against you. It's easy to slide into hopelessness and then begin to slide into depression. All right? So these people may be, this may indicate that the people are depressed. The horses represent angels. We know this because horses was the fastest mode that people could travel back then, and angels travel really fast. That's what the connection is. We also know they're angels because they report to the angel of the Lord, right? And we know they're angels because they're sent to wander the earth like the angels of Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. So they're angels. And real quick, I want to talk about angels. Next slide, please, Miss Kaylee. Angels are spiritual beings who are created by God and serve Him. They are their own race or races of spiritual beings. In the Bible, we see them serving people God saves. We see them delivering messages. We see them waging spiritual battles. We see them worshiping God. We see them serving God. We see them executing judgment. And they aid in the transmission of God's word. But they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to, to people who are saved. People who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, in this vision, we see a people who are, be God's people are beaten down by their situation, are unaware that God's angels are moving among them to provide help. God's people, they feel like they've been beaten down. They feel like they're being kicked around. They feel like they can't find victory. They feel like everything's around them. But they don't realize all this supernatural help is going on around them. Angels are, and listen, whether you know it or not, you, I know you don't see them, but I guarantee you there's angelic activity in this room right now. Angels on scene around you are moving around you and performing different functions in honor to God. We are not alone. You are not alone, saint of God. The Bible reminds us, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. We interact with angels despite the fact that we don't see them. And, and just, just like um, it says in uh, Hebrews 1.14, that are they not all in ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Listen, whether you realize it or not, you probably have your own entourage of angels. Yeah. You do. We, we think, we, when we think of angels, we think of, of those who are there to protect us. What, what do we call them? I know there's a word. Guardian angels, right? But there are angels that probably help you with your spiritual growth. They probably help you. They're to help you when you minister to other people. They were probably there to help you when you're praying to give you, to give you understanding. When you're in God's word to give you understanding. Whatever it is that you're doing for God, there are angels surrounding you. Angels are all around you. And God wants you to know that they're there. Now, you don't have to get obsessed with them. Some people get, they get obsessed with, oh, I, I wish I could see angels. Listen, if you serve God long enough, you're going to see angels. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Even if it takes you until you get all the way to heaven, you're going to see angels, okay? The biggest thing you need to know about them is they're there. And they're, they're working for you because they're working for God on your behalf. At this time... God, Israel was, okay. Now, the angels also report to God. We see that in this vision. They give a report to the angel of the Lord, right? And they make this declaration. They say, the whole earth is sitting still and is at rest. At first, that might seem like a good thing. But think about it. Are these people in a good situation? No, they're not. No, they're not. These people are at the bottom. They feel beat down. They feel beat up. They feel kicked around, right? They're not winning. They're, they're not overcoming. They're, they're not working for God. You know, that, this was a time when God's people were not rebuilding the temple or the city in times that were hard. They were supposed to be working to expand God's kingdom, but they were not. Zechariah 1.21, if you keep reading reveals that these people were afraid to lift up their heads. In other words, they were walking around in fear. 
in fear of the world, in fear of situations, in fear of what was going on all around them. Instead of doing what God called them to do and rebuilding the city and temple, they're hiding. At this time, God, Israel was God's sole representative on the earth. The people of the earth are operating under spiritual oppression, and the only people capable of doing anything are doing nothing. Now listen, if God has assigned all these angels to you, right, and you sit around and do nothing but watch TV, what do you think your angels are doing? What do you think they're doing? Look at this vision again. What do you see? God's people doing nothing. And all these angels walking around. Oh, I wish somebody would pray. Oh, I wish somebody would open a Bible. Somebody witness. Somebody build a temple. Somebody do something. How many times are your angels... Oh, I wish he'd open his Bible today so I could give him some revelation and understanding. Mm. How many times are they, they, are they, oh, I wish she would get on her knees and pray. I so love to carry her messages to God, her prayers to the Lord. Mm. I wish he'd get out and witness because I love to, oh, I wish he'd lay hands on the sick. I, I'd be honored to help minister that healing from the presence of God. Our angels all around us, and they're sitting around, bored out of their minds, waiting for us to do something for God. Makes me wonder if there's like an unemployment line in heaven or something. They all up there collecting unemployment, <laughs> waiting for God's people to do something. So the real question in all of this is, what are your angels doing? What are they up to? Now check this next part out. The angel of the Lord, when he gets this report, he cries out, God, when are you going to have mercy on the people of Israel? The 70 years of indignation, they're over. They're done with. This angel is like us. He's praying, advocating for revival. But we often ask the Lord to send revival as if we had no part to play in it. What did we just learn about revival? Repentance and conversion Prepare the way for revival. If you truly want revival, you've got to learn to be the revival that you want to see. And revival is the first step toward restoration. So God answers. Oh, it, well, we look at the condition of this world. Let's, let's stretch it further. We look at the condition of this world and we ask, God, why don't you do something? You see all this stuff on Facebook, all these Christians yelling at each other, all the world falling apart, all this craziness. Why don't you do something? God said, I did. I sent Jesus to provide salvation and I've sent you, my church, to tell everyone about it. Restoration of the world comes through my church. And we're like, well, wait a second, God, but your church is in a mess. Why don't you send revival? God said, I told you how to get there. Repent and be converted. Be the revival that you want to see. We say, well, I feel defeated. Situations are overwhelming me. God says, my son gave you victory. And victory starts in your life when you begin to agree with me that I made you victorious. It doesn't start when you see the victory. It starts when you agree with the victory he already won for you. You see, God... God answers this angel by comforting him, by speaking good, comfortable words to him. And then he says this. He said, I'm jealous for my people. Don't you know I'm jealous? I'm, I'm fighting for my people. He said, and all those people that are, that are messing with my people, I'm angry that they're doing that. I'm returned to my people with great mercies. And I promise you that, my, that this site will be measured and the house will be rebuilt. What God is saying is, I'm committed to doing my part in this. If you step out in faith and do what I told you to do, I will do my part. I want to see revival more than you do. The problem's not with God. We cry out to God, but God is jealous and will fight for us. God is fighting and warring for us. And he says, I know you've been beaten down. You know, because the people of that day were beaten down. They were so beaten down by circumstances. They were agreeing with defeat and discouragement, saying things like, the time has not come that the Lord's house should be rebuilt. That's Haggai 1-2. 
But God is saying, get up and rebuild. The 70 years are old or over. Get up and, and go to work. Listen, I don't know what's going to manifest next in the world. I don't know what's going to go on next in the world. But I do know this. God wants us to get up and get to work. To get up and get to work. I'm going to leave you with one thing. Just one more thing. And then we're, we're going to close this out. In July of 2009, and some of you may have been at the, this event. I know I'm, I, I personally witnessed one of the most inc incredible supernatural events that I've ever been a part of. It was a prayer meeting at an octagon tabernacle in a place up the road called Salk in New York. Some of you were there. Uh, I, it, it was declared that over 700 lightning strikes happened around that building. I personally remember going out in the middle of prayer, standing on the porch and watching them strike in a literal circle around the building. Absolutely incredible. I remember that, 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 that the storms outside, that they grew in frequency and intensity as the people cried out with God, and then they would subside when, we, when, when, when our prayers subsided. They, they, they literally moved with the prayers of the people. I remember hearing the testimony of one lady. She was late for the event, and she started driving and, and, and experienced absolutely no rain, no storms at all until she got to the boundary of Falcon. She drove through the storm, increased when she got near the, because she didn't know where the Octagon Tabernacle was, right? A and then she kept driving, and then the storm began to dissipate as she moved away from it. And when she got outside Falcon again, no more storm again. So she turned right back in and came, came to the revival. Uh, th those of you who are there know what a powerful meeting it was. But there was one man, and... Uh, and I don't think most of the people here know him, but he was an elder in one of the churches that was attending that revival. And he testified that he encountered a company of angels that night. And <laughs> the angels asked him, they said, what are you guys doing here? What? And, and he said, well, we're praying. And they asked him, what are you praying for? And he said, Revival. And the angels turned to him and said, good, we've been waiting for you. We've been waiting for you. All of heaven, all of heaven is waiting for God's people to hear his cry and get to work. This is a season for you guys, for us, to get to work. It's a season to be about the master's business. Amen. If you all stand up, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and... We'll, we'll call it. We'll call it. A, call it a night. <laughs> Just raise your hands. Just raise your hands to God, Father God. You see us. We are your people, and you see us. We confess we need you in this season. We need your anointing. We need your touch, God. We know this is a season unlike any other, and God, we know that the challenges and the demands of this season are unlike anything that have been faced before. But God, you created us for this season. Each and every one of us was placed on the earth for such a time as this, just like Esther. And Lord, I pray that you will anoint your people, touch your people, touch us, your people, God. Encourage us in this season. Strengthen us in this season. Help us to be bold in this season. Because you've got a work for us to do. And we receive your touch right now. We receive your touch. We thank you for your anointing. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Love you, Miss Sherry.